Thanks for watching CBS 8 Plus and welcome to this throwback special. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. With more than 70 years of broadcasting, we've been able to share so many memorable moments, moments that changed San Diego forever. In this throwback special, we dive into our CBS 8 archives to look at the setting for the biggest sports events and concerts to hit San Diego over the course of 50 plus years. Whether you knew it as San Diego Stadium, the Murph, the Q, or even SDCCU, you knew it was the place to be. The Chargers and Padres called it home. It hosted three Super Bowls, a World Series, and two MLB All-Star Games. It also played host to the biggest and baddest musical acts around. Let's take a look at how it all started in a much different looking Mission Valley. Amid the farms and fields of Mission Valley, a landmark was under construction, bringing San Diego into the big leagues. A huge stadium, the future home of the Chargers, the Padres, and the San Diego State Aztecs. San Diego Stadium would host Super Bowls, World Series, Holiday Bowls, concerts, and so much more. The name would change a few times to Jack Murphy Stadium, to Qualcomm, and finally to SDCCU. In this film from 1966, three of the San Diego Chargers inspected their future home and shared their thoughts with TV8. Uh, you've got one more season in Balboa Stadium, and then it's down here in 67, huh? Well, it looks that way, and I hope I'm around to uh, be able to play here in this wonderful stadium. But if not, I'm quite sure I'll come back and visit to play in it. <laughs> I hope we see you play in it, Paul, and best of luck. I hope you break that rushing record right here in the new stadium uh, in 67. Well, without a doubt, if I'm here, uh, I've got the trip to run on, and uh, the horses to push me, so why not? Thank you very much. George, uh, what are your thoughts standing here looking at what will be the future home and uh, very like future home with the Chargers? I hope they uh, get rid of some of these rocks and put some nice soft grass so we, <laughs> so we land on something real soft. It uh, really looks like it's going to be a real nice stadium uh, and the larger crowds are sure going to make it more exciting. Well, best of luck to you and you'll help make it very exciting here too. Thank you. And Bob, uh, I'll ask you the same question. What are your thoughts about uh, the new home down here as it looks now? I think the people of San Diego made the right decision when they voted for this, and it looks like it's going to really be something big. Bob, what's the finest stadium you've ever played in? I haven't yet. It's probably, I hope this will be. Hard to believe that's the same Mission Valley that is now packed with housing and hotels, shopping centers, and other businesses. Uh, from a patch of dirt to a state-of-the-art multi-purpose masterpiece, the stadium opened up in 1967. Pomp, pageantry, and fireworks were highlights of an opening celebration built around a Chargers game. And as John Howard shows us, the stadium wasn't the only sports venue building San Diego's reputation as a big league city. The pomp and circumstance of San Diego stadium dedication was impressive, even if the football game wasn't. Mayor Frank Curran called the 50,000 seat stadium dramatic evidence of the spirit of the can-do city. Lieutenant Governor Robert Finch said, quote, happiness is a beautiful stadium, end quote. Finch helped Al Hartunian of the stadium authority display the perpetual trophy that will be awarded the winner of next Sunday's Chargers-Rams game. Then the action on the field against the Detroit Lions. Halftime was a colorful program of bandsmen from throughout Southern California. The show, staged by Pacific Pageants of Los Angeles, was indeed patriotic. Cost of the halftime show was $18,000, compared to $27.5 million spent on the sports edifice, which seemed well worth the time and effort that brought the stadium into being. The highlight of the halftime ceremonies was the detonating of fireworks and the releasing of balloons. A salute to sports was the theme of the annual meeting of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. The group toured two of the city's newest sports facilities, starting at the San Diego Stadium in Mission Valley and then going to the sports arena on Midway Drive. President S. Falk Nielsen said, San Diego has taken on a new image with the development of two such outstanding sports facilities in one year. They bolster the Bureau's nationwide promotional theme that San Diego is excitement. The Bureau members saw everything from electronic controls to the locker rooms. The stadium was a real winner, but it did take a few years for the teams playing in it to really catch up. 
1984, the Padres were finally the real deal, rewarding diehard fans with the postseason to remember. Doug McAllister was at game four of the National League Championship Series when Steve Garvey helped make sure that the Cubs would have to wait a couple more decades to get the World Series monkey off their backs. And in 1998, after almost 30 years in the major leagues, the Padres would make it to a second World Series. Our Steve Price was there for the clincher in the division series, way up in the cheap seats of what was then called Qualcomm Stadium. It was an outstanding night for a game. No question Padre fans were ready and even relatively nice to their Cub counterparts. Inside, years of pent-up frustration were cut loose. It's called the tenth player, this fan support. It's usually found around a winner, but some Padre fans have been at it for 16 years. Yeah. 16 years in the same seat. Are you ready for tonight? Well, I, I sure hope so. I'm really hoping that we're going to win, naturally. Padre fans have been hit pretty hard by the national and Chicago media lately, and they were out to dispel their laid-back image with a deafening reply to every ball, strike, and hit in the Padres' favor. By the middle of the seventh, it was still a 3-3 game. No winner, no loser, no leader. Just so far, an outstanding and exciting Major League Baseball game. At the end of a classic baseball evening, in the bottom of the ninth, Padre fans got what they came for. Playoff game four even things up in the series and maybe once and for all for the team and its fans. Respect has been a long time coming. Doug McAllister, News 8. Come on, let's go! Woo! Rudy Ortega may call it the best view in the stadium, but his seat in section 61, row 29, is the farthest from the field. He bought his ticket this morning for 14 bucks. They just sell me the ticket. They said, we got 100 tickets left. So my friend and I, we just came here and buy the tickets. Rudy's just one of the 64,889 people who packed into the queue tonight with signs, towels, and one major goal, to make a lot of noise. Farthest seat from home plate, but he definitely doesn't have the worst seat in the house. That honor belongs to Donnie Stablon. Donnie's supposed to be sitting in section 20, row 18, seat 18. Here's his view of the game. You can't even see the guy batting, so it's pretty much piss poor. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. Donnie moved down a row for a better angle. He's lucky there weren't many open seats to move into. Padres fans packed the queue creating a feeling few fans have ever felt before. It's intense. It's an adrenaline rush. It's awesome. Yeah! Oh, it's wonderful. It's great. We enjoy it. As the game moved on, the crowd got louder. One, and when Wally Joyner hit an eighth inning home run to put the game out of reach, <laughs> the fans knew tonight they wouldn't leave the queue feeling blue. So they stood through the whole ninth inning and cheered on Trevor Hoffman as he set down the Astros in order to seal the win. Kissing off the Astros for good, now bring on Atlanta. From Qualcomm Stadium, Steve Price, KFNB News 8. And 25 years later, Friars fans are still waiting for that first World Series win. All right, the Chargers, they went through years of mediocrity, sprinkled in with a few years of exceptional high-flying football powered by Air Coriel in the early 80s. But in the 1994 season, they reached new heights, finally making it to a Super Bowl. The city went crazy with thousands of fans welcoming the team home from the AFC Championship and even more getting together for a parking lot show of spirit. By the time the team arrived at about 8.40 p.m., the fans were frenzied. 
San Diego had finally come of age. A teary-eyed junior sale echoed that sentiment. Now, the world, the world, the world, the world. is going to know. Not about Junior Sam. Not about Nature on Me. Not about Stan Huff. Not about Leslie O'Neill. But the San Diego Chargers. They started arriving late last night. This morning, there were already tens of thousands of them. Charger fans. By sunrise, a giant lightning bolt like no other. It's history being made right now, right now. This is first time Charger history. And these Charger fans were determined to be a part of it. I've been here since 3.15 this morning. I thought I was early. Found out that they was here at 11 o'clock last night. Why? Because the Chargers are going to win the Super Bowl! The human bolt was sponsored by a local radio station. Turnout was phenomenal. Ran along the fence around the stadium, then it doubled back, then it turned, then it doubled back again. A lot of standing. Kind of felt like a cow. Go Chargers! <laughs> there were bolt dogs, bolt heads, and those who were simply bolted out. Some danced, others screamed. Well, he's wondering what's gotten into mom and dad. They were charged. One woman said the crowd was so excited, she was shoved to the ground. People are going a little bit too crazy, I think. It's not as safe. It was one wild party, but the message is clear. We're going all the way. We're bringing it home. We're bringing the ring home. Perhaps lightning will strike again. Judy Sue News 8 at the stadium. Chargers are gone a while now, but I know a lot of you incredible fans still here. Okay, what better place to come in the middle of winter to watch a football game in person than San Diego? The NFL sure liked the idea, so much so that it held three Super Bowls here over the course of just 15 years. First up, the big game in 1988 when Washington gave Denver a Bronco beatdown. Bronco! going to be absolute chaos and mayhem. <laughs> it was way back in January 1988 when San Diego hosted its first Super Bowl at what was then Jack Murphy Stadium. Here's what the stadium looks like inside and it's looking pretty good. Fans of the Denver Broncos and of the Washington football team, which had a different name back then, came to San Diego for Super Bowl 22. 75 to 85,000 of them. Broncos coach Dan Reeves enjoyed the warm welcome. Uh, we have had uh, super facilities. The people have been extraordinarily nice and the weather's been fantastic. We caught Denver meteorologist Cliff Nicholson from our sister station KUSA taking photos of Shamu in between his live weather hits that he beamed back via satellite to a chilly Colorado. I called up about 10 o'clock this morning and it was 23 degrees out in Denver and here it was about 60 degrees. Now that is fabulous. I'm going to make everybody so jealous. Check out this halftime show, an 80s extravaganza called Something Grand, featuring the Rockettes, 88 Grand Pianos, and Chubby Checker, who you can hear sing in the twist. This show, 33 years ago, marked the first time a major performer made an appearance in a Super Bowl. The Broncos were defeated that year, but a decade later... We're going to take that baby all the way to the Super Bowl and get that ring. In January 1998... Hey, go Broncos! The team returned to San Diego... Broncos fans, Packers fans, guys, come here and take a look. ...for Super Bowl 32... Yeah hoping for a different outcome, this time taking on the Green Bay Packers. There's a bunch of weird people out here. Go back. And I recognize this voice. I just have one question for you. Yeah. yeah. Why? Super fan. Our Steve Price got a little cheesy with Packers fans outside of Qualcomm Stadium. Cheese heads, cheese neckties, and cheese, never seen that before. And the Broncos did win their first ever Super Bowl that year. Super Bowl 37, a game so big and exciting, I can't find the words to describe it. It's stupendous. It's magnificacious. It's stupendous. Five years later, in 2003, San Diego hosted its third and final Super Bowl at the Q. Yeah, we're just having a good time, man. Chilling with the boys all week long. Just no kids, no wife. Just, just hang out with the boys playing ball all week long. 
The Raiders of Oakland back then versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for Super Bowl 37. The Bucks ended up winning. And fans who waited a long time for that victory celebrated in the streets of San Diego. After 27 years, it's it's over. The games were such a success, you'd think the league would have tried a little harder to keep a team here. Surrounding the stadium, more than 100 acres of pure, perfect parking lot. Much more than a place to park cars while at a big game, it turned into its own gathering place, a village of sorts for rabid Padres and Chargers fans. Tailgating became such a big deal in San Diego that we found people who were camped out the night before the game back in the early 80s. The Sea of Asphalt was the perfect place to hang out with kindred spirits before the main event. Chargers colors started to appear outside San Diego Stadium shortly after sunup this morning. First, the campers came and the scent of breakfast mixed with the smell of beer in the early morning breeze. Now there were well-known stars around the parking lot early this morning along with the average fans. For example, the Kelcher brothers. Huey and Dewey. No, we just take great pleasure in beating the pants off Oakland Raiders. It seems that virtually everyone at the stadium has something with Charger colors on it. My favorites were the campers, like this one, which I suppose is painted differently for each home game. Or this one, that Jim Carr and his wife Valerie painted during a long weekend. We had the 4th of July weekend. Mom and I had three days, so we figured, well, why don't we just paint the camper and just get ready for this coming season, because we really don't have, we don't have any off season. Everything imaginable that can be made with Charger colors on it has been made. T-shirts, hats, there were even Charger cakes and a Charger flower to be worn by the well-dressed fan. The season is here. But not a moment too soon for some people. I have no doubt that without a football fix soon, some of these people could be dangerous. Or and then Carol, News 8, Mission Valley. In the summertime, San Diegans flock to the ocean, and people will pay a king's ransom for a shack with a view of the California coastline. But in recent years, more and more San Diegans have been attracted to asphalt. There's nothing we'd rather do on our day off than get together with our family and friends and head on down to the parking lot for a picnic. Ah, yeah, there's just something about the great outdoors and the smell of burgers barbecuing mixed with the exhaust fumes of passing automobiles. And nothing will put a little added excitement into a game of touch football or frisbee like having to dodge in and out of the paths of oncoming cars. And some of these tailgate parties are catered so exquisitely that they should be black tie optional. Partying in parking lots has become such a phenomenon that folks are tailgating in the stadium lot the night before the game, and even on Sundays when the Chargers are on the road. Sitting, standing, eating, drinking, and playing on asphalt is becoming one of America's favorite pastimes. Who knows, someday the parking lot may become as big a recreational area as the beach. And then property values around this lot will escalate. And before you know it, we'll be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a shack with a view of the asphalt. For News 8, I'm Larry Himmel at large San Diego Stadium parking lot. Opening day. No better feeling. And if you could bottle that feeling, you'd have thousands of Padre fans lined up. In fact, they're already here. And there's no place they'd rather be. Uh, it's the ballpark, the hot dogs, the green field, and having this team, the magic, the fans, the combat. It's worth a toast and a spread. After all, this is the most optimistic day of the year for baseball fans. Cheers! We are so happy. I can't tell you how happy. We want the Padres <laughs> to win. We love the Padres. We are avid fans. You don't say. But there is one guy who might not be real welcome in the stadium parking lot, judging by the popularity of this booth. Yo, yes! <laughs> Fans had their chance to lob a tomato at a Bruce Henderson dummy. He's the one who tried to get a stadium expansion referendum on the ballot. You know, there is so much enthusiasm here in the parking lot. The sun's out. People are so pumped. They are ready for the season to begin. I really can't think of anything that would put a damper on all this, unless maybe you park next to somebody who doesn't exactly share your musical taste. Yikes. Or there's live entertainment that's a little less intense. 
Yep, the fans have survived another off-season. Welcome to the stadium. Hi. And now it's time to play ball and just play. Jody Hammond, KFMB News 8, the stadium. So much good fun. Besides sporting events, concerts were the biggest attractions at the stadium. A show in 1979 featured Blue Oyster Cult, Pat Travers, UFO, and Cheap Trick. Big enough names for sure, but much bigger would follow as the stadium played host to the biggest names in rock and roll over the decades. And the shows came in all shapes and sizes from the massive machine that was a Rolling Stones world tour to a new wave takeover to a family friendly Beach Boys concert. Just waiting in line outside San Diego Stadium Sunday was an event in itself. Thousands of young people gathered in huge lines, waiting impatiently, and at times the crowds were yelling for the gates to open. <laughs> Find some kind of crazy people. What brings you out here? What's, what's the excitement out here? Party Music! Out. Party! What do you think, man? All the weird people. <laughs> Have a good time? You know? For the hell of it. Nothing better to do on a Saturday. Sunday, I mean. Security for the big rock concert was tripled, and for good reason. There was an abundance of alcohol, marijuana, and drugs. Police did nothing to stop that kind of activity in the parking lot, but once the gates opened, some arrests were made. In the first two hours of the concert, more than a dozen people had been arrested. People were not allowed to bring in cameras, cans, bottles, chairs, weapons, pets, and strangely enough, blankets and pillows into the stadium, so they were discarded along with hundreds of pounds of assorted trash. And inside the stadium, the crowd was going absolutely crazy over the deafening sounds of the heavy rock. Headlining the concert, Blue Oyster Cult, Pat Travers, UFO, and Cheap Trick. Promoters say the concert is a big smash, but city officials will hold off any opinion of whether future rock concerts will be allowed in the stadium. Jesse Macias, News 8, San Diego Stadium. Things were pretty mellow in the stadium parking lot during the early morning hours following an all-night camp out that included about 10,000, quite enough to allow a few sleepyheads to catch a few extra winks in the sunshine. But as you might expect, there was activity around the portable bathrooms and at the head of the lines where the most avid fans camped out to be the first ones in. What was it like last night? It was crazy. People all over the place. Was people drinking, partying, everything else. Oh, it was great. Everybody had a wild time. Everybody was just and drinking beer, smoking pot, and just hanging out, waiting for, the, waiting for the stones to come on today. It was real mellow in this line. You know, we had a good time. Everyone's sleeping out, lots of room. By mid-morning, a party goer or two could barely walk. Some spent a lot of money for a concert they may never see. The gates were supposed to open by 10, but when there were delays, the crowd got restless. The idea was to let them in slowly, 50 at a time, so they could be given the once-over for drugs and weapons. The gates were opened finally at 1040, and the hope for a trickle turned into a frenzied rush. few managed to slip past without a search, but for the most part, it was a friendly and somewhat cooperative crowd. When it's all over, the Rolling Stones concert is expected to rank as the largest musical extravaganza the city of San Diego has ever known. The 10,000 or so who camped out here last night are expected to swell to something like 70,000 for the actual concert itself. So the Rolling Stones are going to get a royal welcome in San Diego. And Shaw, News 8 at the stadium. Those who survived an afternoon of partying hardy, an hour later than advertised, finally saw the curtains part and out strutted the court jester of rock and roll, Mick Jagger and his Rolling Stones. They opened the concert with the sexist anthem, Under My Thumb. The Stones performed 22 songs. They did them all, from their latest best-selling album, Tattoo You, to the classics. are seeing is all very modern so they say modern to the young people who are here for the first ever modern music festival Okay, 
they dress weird. Okay, maybe real weird. But not all of San Diego's young people who enjoy modern music shave or color their hair. You can be part of the new music yeah, without shaving your head. Enjoy it. I know. You can be normal and enjoy it, man. You don't have to be like those guys out there. Why is your hair like that? I like it this style. Why is your hair like that? I like it this style. The festival is loud, but it is modern. The music must be good, or else there wouldn't be 25,000 people here. Suddenly, I don't feel so modern. Carlos Amesqua, News 8, at the X Festival. <laughs> It's become a tradition, the Beach Boys post-Padre Mother's Day concert. One American tradition following another. The combination obviously popular. Seats for today were sold out months ago. The Beach Boys are clearly boys in name only now. While they obviously appeal to today's teens, many of the kids who came to their concerts 25 years ago now bring their own kids. Aren't these Beach Boy fellas old, though? Not really. They don't act like it. Good karma. That's what it is. Good karma. Whatever it is, the Beach Boys obviously have it, and they don't seem to be losing it. They're about to embark on their longest tour ever. Lorraine Kimmel, News 8, at the stadium. The stadium was typically a gathering place of celebration, rooting on the hometown teams or cheering for your favorite bands. But in 2001, after the September 11th attacks, it was a place to gather for comfort and community, with San Diegans holding each other up and celebrating all it means to be an American. It was an event thrown together by what was then our sister radio station, Star 100.7, Jeff and Jer, along with little Tommy and Laura, pulling everyone together. They came by the thousands. People slept here overnight. People slept in their cars. People walked here. People came here from England. There's a woman here from England, from Pennsylvania, from Albuquerque, from LA. People of all ages, backgrounds, and colors all for the red, white, and blue. Well, this thing just started to grow and grow and grow, and we filled up the flag by like 5.30 this morning. There's not much that I can do as far as picking up some guns and heading out there, so decided that I'd come and kind of spread the spirit to all the children out here today. It's pretty amazing how many have come out, so I brought my face paints, and we're doing flags and stars, and just forever wants to come and get one. The crowd is incredible. Every time somebody in a military uniform walks by, everybody starts cheering. After last week's attacks, the communion of emotion was welcome medicine. Melanie McIntyre immigrated from Northern Ireland. I'm an American now, and I loved how all of America came together in this. It was, it just blew me away. So I'm standing here to be a proud American with everybody else. It's a happy, it's happy, it's very, high. Very happy, yeah. very high, very happy. Everyone's very excited to be here. I believe everybody wants to be part of this. So it's great to be here. There were cheers and applause and some tears of joy and sorrow, strong emotions and determination. I'm down here because I'm mad. I'm mad at um, Osama bin Laden for all that stuff. Okay, I'm gonna show him that um, he's gonna go down. What it means is everyone in this, can in this country is standing strong and that we're proud to be American and we know what it stands for and that's our freedom. At Qualcomm Stadium, Dan Shadwell, KFMB News 8. By 2021, what had been Jack Murphy Stadium, Qualcomm Stadium, and SDCCU Stadium was once again San Diego Stadium. After more than 50 years, everything had come full circle, and what had been an empty pasture would soon be a big dirt lot once again. But the demolition would be deliberate. The stadium not going out with a bang as much as retreating into the ground and into our past. All done right to set the stage for the future. 
In December of last year, SDCCU Stadium's name rights expired, so I guess what you'd call this is San Diego Stadium. So why, if Cruz has started working on demolishing it in October, that so little of it is done, and why didn't they just blow it all up? It's been called many names, Jack Murphy, Qualcomm, SDCCU, and its original name, San Diego Stadium. But I guess now you could just call it rubble. Well, not quite. Judging by these aerials from yesterday, you could probably still watch a football game in there, if there are still seats. So why didn't we get a nice satisfying explosion like the old King Dome here? An implosion of the stadium would violate California clean air laws. The stadium, which was built in 1967, used materials that are now illegal in construction projects. So to keep it safe, crews have to take it down piece by piece. Things like asbestos and PCB and stuff that has to be uh, extracted carefully. It, it's not like you just blow this up and then send asbestos and other toxins just wafting across the city of San Diego. Dr. Peter Anderson is a professor of communications at SDSU and also the outgoing chair of the Environmentally Conscious Sierra Club. The 166 acre land that the stadium sat on is now owned by SDSU. The vast development that the school has plans to undertake is supported by Anderson and his organization. A riparian habitat much like it was originally along with hiking trails and bike trails along it. It's not all going to be cement but there's going to be a lot of lawns uh, where students and the community can uh, can hang out. Along with the planned green space, Anderson is quick to point out that the materials used in the old stadium will be recycled for use on the new campus. Because there's a similar proposal to recycle as much of that material from the old Falcom Stadium as possible in terms of building this new campus. With green space and trails, smaller parking lots to encourage public transportation, Anderson believes that the school is making positive steps to make the Mission Valley project in San Diego a little greener. But overall, this has been a pretty good project from an environmental standpoint. Tim Blodgett, News 8. So many memories. I guess we'll have to make more at Snapdragon. Thank you so much for watching this throwback special. To see more throwbacks like this on CBS 8 Plus, click on the News tab at the top of the screen. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. We'll see you next time.